Hello, welcome or welcome back. Happy to have you however you got here. Today we are talking about A Tip for the Hangman by Alison Epstein. This is a 2021 release, but I haven't seen a whole lot about it. I don't even really remember how I stumbled across it. Maybe a friend added it. Maybe I saw it on the library app. I don't remember. Maybe I saw the publisher post about it on Instagram. There are options. I stumbled across it. And it is about Christopher Marlowe and Christopher Marlowe as a spy. So it combines two things I really, really enjoy, which are theater and Tudor England. So the cover does remind me like of historical fiction a little bit in like the 2000s. It feels like this is the kind of book that in like the 2000s really would have been everywhere because we were seeing a lot of historical fiction, specifically Tudor fiction post the other Boleyn girl. Granted, this is a little bit, this is at removed from court a little bit more, but it's kind of that same vein. There's another author I'm thinking of spatially. Like I could tell you what corner of the library I worked in as a teen, the books were, maybe it was Matthew Pearl. Maybe it's Matthew Pearl I'm thinking of because I'm thinking of how the alphabet wrapped. I think that is what I'm thinking, like the Dante Club. Granted, I checked that book out so many times as a teen and just never read it. I probably had it out for months at a time at some point because I could just keep renewing it for myself. <laughs> anyway, neither here nor there. It, it That's kind of what made me think of. And it is interesting because we haven't, or I haven't been seeing Tudor fiction in this way. Granted, it's coming at it kind of from a bend, like I said, in that we're not directly in court in the way that we kind of were at the height of things. But I do think we got a lot more kind of everyman historical fiction. I'm not saying we're not seeing it now. I'm just saying I guess I've seen less of it. And they're like, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Things go in waves. And also like we just came off the Mirror and the Light, the last in the Cromwell series just dropped last year. So we finally got a, an end to that saga as well. That was like a decade in the making almost. But Marlowe's a different thing. And I did briefly go back to my theater history notes before sitting down to kind of situate myself. I have read two of his works because I mean Marlowe is a renowned Elizabethan playwright. He is kind of second to Shakespeare in most circles. Granted, I'm not a major scholar, but he's the one where people have conspiracy theories regarding Shakespeare. There's a whole wealth of stuff there and I feel like this is going to turn into a babble a little bit, so bear with me and I'm sorry. I have personally read of his plays. I've read Edward II and I read Dr. Faustus because Dr. Faustus is what we read in theater history and Edward II I read about as a source in another historical fiction I was reading and was like hmm and then I read it. So the book this book focuses on Marlowe as a spy and I was like I knew that it had always been a thing that was kind of talked about with Marlowe but I went back to my theater history notes and it's like Marlowe was a spy. So keep in mind my research for this has kind of limited itself to those notes. So I have like, okay, we pretty much accepted that he was a spy in some capacity, but I haven't done a whole lot extra research. But it starts out with him in school and like kind of his first foray into spying. And then we jump forward in time into him already being a successful playwright. And then another plot that kind of ties back into his first case that he worked. And that was interesting. The first case that he works in his school days puts him in the household of Mary Queen of Scots, which I was like, yeah, this makes sense to me. It's not historically accurate. And she talks about that in the author's note. It's a little bit of artistic license, but I feel like when you're thinking of like plots at this time, you're thinking of the Catholic plots. You're thinking of the plots to overthrow Elizabeth on her throne. I mean, which is why you have spy masters in the first place, right? To protect the throne. Mary is kind of the pinnacle of that. So it was interesting because we did get a little bit of Mary's point of view at one point and that kind of that kind of drives into it too in that this is a third person but we're focused on Kit Marlowe, Kit Marlowe, except sometimes we pull back and focus on other people specifically like his 
friend and later lover Tom, and then Mary Queen of Scots, and then some of the other spies. And it did take me out of the moment sometimes but I understand narratively kind of why we had to do it because we needed a little bit more knowledge than Kit was going to have if we stuck close to on him and we needed that outside view. But it did kind of upset the reading flow a little bit, especially because it took a second for the first one to come in and the narrative tone wasn't so different that I was immediately like, yes, this is a new person we're with here. I had to kind of come to that realization and I feel like both those jumps and the time jumps did kind of make it hard for us to follow Kit all the way, if that makes sense. Like he, he's so charming and, and snappy and witty and he's always flirting with the edge of danger, which I think is evident in his writing as well but he is this witty, smart individual. And that wit and those smarts and that taking that for granted, it kind of carries us through the narrative a little bit. Like it talks about him being this master spy. And I'm like, we've seen him on one job though. Or he's called in for this second job five years or more later. And they're like, you are a master code breaker. And I'm like, he's broken the one code. I mean, it was an important code, the Mary Queen of Scots plot was a was a pretty big plot slash code, but but it was just the one. So there's this like difference in experience. So it's like we get this one really intense plot, and then we're supposed to take it for granted that he's this expert spy because he pretended to be a footman in Mary Queen of Scots' household. And I don't know. Also, he was kind of dumb because there was another spy. Uh, I, I'm, I'm probably gonna be saying this wrong, but he, it was around the Babington plot, which is a well-known, you know, plot because it's what brought all of this down. But there's another spy in that household, in the other household that's coming to visit. And he's like really slow on the uptake in figuring out that it's another spy. Now, granted, I would also be slow on the uptake, but I am not a spy. So I was like, okay, this is our master plotter, I guess. And sure, he can talk himself out of just about anything, to use a theater term. It was a little bit of having to suspend my disbelief because I was like, he's a good spy, but he's not the best spy. We've only seen him on the one time. And I think too, just like having that jump was a little jarring for that because we didn't get to know him. We were just getting to know him, right? We get to that initial plot and we've started to see character growth and change and then we're like and we're gonna skip five years and we're kind of dealing with a new person after that so it's 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 very episodic in that way it is tied through by that through line of the plotting and then his machinations and his spying so i guess if those are the two plots he's going to be involved with it makes sense but it is very episodic but also this is the time in theater where we're starting to see a lot more episodic work and that pulling back from the unity of time in narrative and skipping around. So maybe that was planned. I don't know if it was as effective as I would have liked it to be for me as a reader, but I can go with it. Also, these books are just kind of fun too. Like there's some of the books you just want to go on the adventure. I will say the voice was very modern and readable. It's just a matter of, you know, that race to the finish, especially as part two, the structure of part two is kind of interesting. Cause like part one is kind of like setting us up for part two. And it feels like that is a little bit tighter in terms of its internal journey. And then of course the Mary Queen of Scots plot, I just love. But part two has to kind of bring us to that frantic end, right? And this too is kind of the hard part of historical fiction in this vein in that we know what the ending is, or most people do, or they have access to it. You know, he has a pretty famously gruesome end. And so it's all about how we get to that ending, whether we're going to deviate from that ending, and I'm not going to tell you whether one way or the other what we do, but that is always 
a specter in the space of where we're heading. And so part two feels a little bit more frantic. We start with him at kind of the peak of his success. Once that second plot is kind of set in motion, it feels like everything moves very quickly. And I had a little bit more trouble with the other spies and their resentment of him because he'd been out of the game for so long and they and he gave no clue that he wanted to be back in the game long term. So sure, I understand this idea of jealousy and being angry when you've spent all this time in the game and you feel like someone is coming in and taking your glory, so to speak, or could threaten something you've been working all of these years for. But I also just didn't really totally understand it, if that makes sense. And this is where I'm gonna get into a slight rant that's not at the book, to be clear. So I hadn't heard a whole lot about this book and I went looking for some reviews and I don't usually look up trade reviews, but I did pull up some trade reviews on this one and that may have been a mistake because <laughs> I read it and I just got angry. It did have a valid criticism that matched mine in the, the point of view kind of angle. So it set up the point of view thing as something that was kind of a held them back as a reader in the novel. Again, fair. But then it continued that same sentence where you've already established that this is a, a potential drawback of the narrative and said, and the romance passages are the stuff of bodice rippers. Probably not exact quote. Here's my thing. One, by the nature of the sentence construction, you've set that up as a negative, which if you've watched my video about bad romance takes, which you probably haven't to be fair, you know that that's gonna immediately kind of put me on edge a little bit. Because there's nothing inherently bad with bodice rippers, it's whether that serves the story being told, right? So, so maybe maybe that is a drawback from the story being told, but it doesn't give me a why. It just says, and the stuff of bodice rippers in sentence has it set up as a negative. Okay, what does that take from the narrative? Nothing, one. Two, it's not the stuff of bodice rippers. One, has this person read a bodice ripper? And two, has this person read any regular fiction or genre fiction, literary, genre, mystery, I don't know, just any fiction that's not categorized as romance that has sex scenes in it? Because I read much, much more detailed sex scenes in other fiction than I got in this. And that's, again, not, you know, I wanted more or less. It's just categorically, it was not the stuff of Bodice Rippers, which leads into, okay, this does have a gay relationship at its center. So what are you saying there? Because it wasn't, it wasn't more inherently dirty than most, like it talked about desire. It got to intimate moments, but it wasn't like detailed kind of like you were seeing everything through like a hazy glass. So you got the emotion and the intent, but you weren't seeing specifics. So I have questions about what this person has read. And I, I just feel like that is very dismissive of the emotions and relationships and what that means for the character and the character's humanity in both this narrative and in Bodice Rippers, because often there is a deep emotional truth and emotional core. This book, you know, isn't doing anything majorly revolutionary in terms of its form or even its focus. But I would also argue that we all haven't had a whole, whole lot of fiction recently in this vein where we can just enjoy a nice espionage plot from a famous historical figure and just enjoy the ride. So I think that there's something to be said for that as well. Ultimately, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the references that were sprinkled throughout both for fans of Tudor fiction and this era and for theater people, I guess for lack of a better word, right? We had Shakespeare, we had Kid, and then, you know, that, that ultimate finale and what that is, right? There's a lot of contention around Marlowe's death because how does someone who looms that large in history have the end that the historical record has for him? And I think the narrative does a really good job at building 
this character that is both we can both see the man that lives in the historical record and that could be larger than life enough to give us all of this but also see him as a man as a you know poor young man attempting to escape a family legacy in an area that he knows will trap him but there's just all of these tensions and I think it does a really good job at balancing that and then it also explores so it explores the man and then it explores the morality of all of this we have this really jovial flip it kit that we meet at the beginning and we see what it costs him to be involved in espionage this idea that there is a cost to espionage and especially I think seeing it in this era where it's so entwined with religion and the fate of the soul even for Kit who according to my reading of this you know wasn't super religious but he still had works that dealt with the soul right and I'm definitely gonna have to go I think back to Dr. Faustus and kind of read it with a new lens I do think it gives us a new lens it's not the new lens of like last week's the witch's heart but you know it's just a new way in to something that feels familiar in a form that's fun to read the tone is fun to read yeah I don't know if you read this one I'd love to hear your thoughts if you haven't read it and are interested in the Tudor era and you haven't had a Tudor fix in a while this might be a good place to go it was fun I hate to say that because there was so much death but you know I think you kind of have to expect the plotting and the death if you're going into these kind of narratives but yeah I will talk to you again soon in the meantime read something good and yeah